give him a hand. You may be seated. Thank you so much, Chris, for uh, leading us in an incredible time of prayer, worship, intimacy with God. It was so good. So good. So good. So good. Well, it was just good. It was just wonderful. So, um, you know, it's, I don't know about you, but I needed that. You know, I, I just needed that. I've, I'm on a very heavy schedule. I've, I've been really gone from home now for, since a week ago Sunday. And, and I, I've, just, I've just been in the Middle East uh, teaching and communicating. And, and uh, in fact, I just, I just literally flew from Amman to here Tuesday morning. And of course, then last night I was with some of your people. And today we had a fabulous, fabulous day. Just a fabulous day. I, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's, so, it's so fun to be a part of it. Thanks for letting me be here. Thanks for letting me be a part of your church family. Thanks for letting me, you know, serve you. And, just very grateful, but you know, I just, I've just, and I, I, I leave, I'll speak to the students in the morning, then I go to Texas, and tomorrow afternoon I will speak to all of the public education leaders in the state of Texas. And uh, the, I mean, from, from the top down, and we're having a meeting, the reason we're having this strategic meeting is they've already committed a quarter million of their students to take our values program in the classrooms, and they're considering tomorrow doing it for the entire state. Values curriculum, isn't that beautiful? It's, it's, it's overwhelming, I feel just like you, Chris. How does this all happen? And it only happens because of God, and, and so, so I just have a few more days, but to be able to come and worship with you and uh, just um, worship with you and just feed on his presence was just a beautiful thing. In 1976, on the 4th of July, I was pastor at that time in Lancaster, Ohio. And um, still in my 20s, loving the church, loving pastoring. And of course, it was the 200th anniversary of America. And so we, we had, a, 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 we had a, a 4th of July prayed early on Sunday morning and then had one big outdoor service, and, and, and we had five, over 5,000 people there that day. And it, it, that, I mean, that doesn't sound much to you at all. I mean, shoot, at Highlands, you have 5,000 people every Sunday in your restrooms. <laughs> yeah, so I, mean, it, it's, I was like, but, but if you go back to 1976, that was a big number. And, and, and it, was a, it was a great day, and I, I remember teaching on America Needs Revival, and during the middle of that message, very clearly, the most clearly that I've ever heard God ever talk to me at any time, he just spoke to me and said, you'll spend the rest of your life uh, teaching leadership and developing leaders. I, I wasn't even thinking about leadership. In fact, the message was on America, and, and my mind wasn't even there, but it was very clear to me, and I remember as Margaret and I were going out to dinner right afterwards, and, and I told her, I said, you know, God, God called me today to, to, to do leadership. And she said, well, what are you going to do about it? I said, well, nothing. Uh, if, if really, if, if that's what God wants for me, I'm, I'm glad to do it. But, you know, I, I've, I haven't taught on leadership and this will be new for me. And he'll have to open up the doors in that week. Literally, I had two invitations, different ones from two different states that basically said, would you come? And, and they specifically asked for me to teach leadership. And I did. And, and those doors have opened ever since. And also on that Sunday, it was a beautiful thing. We, we had over 500 people receive Christ that day, including the mayor of the city, uh, a couple of the city council people, the, the head of the school system. I mean, it, it, was, it was just like leadership evangelism, leadership evangelism. And, and it's that, that's been my life. It, it, it's been my life. I, I love 
I love evangelism. I love leadership. It's, it's just, if you want to talk to me about something that'll just make me light up, you just say, let's talk leadership or let's talk evangelism. And I want to talk to you about leadership, if I can, for just a few moments. Because um, the catalyst and the foundation of why I do leadership is, again, when I was about 25, I came to the conclusion that everything rises and falls on leadership. Everything. It, it's true in, in the church. It's, it's true in government. It's true in education. I mean, I, when tomorrow when I deal with leaders of, of, of an entire state in education, th they're going to determine. They're going to determine if, if values curriculum will be in classrooms. Everything, everything rises and falls on leadership. And uh, we have a statement in our companies, and that is that everyone deserves to be led well. And they, and they really do. Every, every person, uh, probably my greatest heartache when I travel internationally is to see so many places and so many people that are suffering because they just, don't, they just don't have good leadership. And if they had good leadership, life would be so much better for them. And, and so let's, let's just think for a moment about everything rises on leadership, everything falls on leadership. Leadership is the great exaggerator in any culture. When it's good, everything is better. And when it's not good, every, everything becomes worse. And one of the things I'm so happy about what you're doing at Highlands College is you're preparing people, you're preparing young leaders, men and women, to, to go out in the harvest field. And, and they're truly going to make the difference. They're going, to, they're going to be ministry majors, but they're going to have a heart for leadership. And the reason I know that is because you at Highlands bleed leadership. I mean, you just, you just, you just are leaders. You're, you're, you're leaders in the church world. Chris is leaders among pastors. You're the most influential church, I think, today in America and probably the world. You're just leadership. But, but wait, 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 it's okay, it's okay. We don't want to force it. <laughs> but, you know, just don't want to force it. But, but, but it's okay because what happened is there were a few people that were ready. And the rest of you watched. <laughs> so I'll just say it again, the whole community of the church and the college, you just live leadership and you bleed leadership and you, you're leaders. That's, that's who you are. That's what you have. That's... And everybody does deserve to, to, to be led well. And, and when they're led well, two things happen. They're led well because men and women who lead them have leadership, good leadership skills, and, and they also lead well because they have good leadership values. And, and to be honest with you, for the last few years, I've been very leadership sad, and, and I'm not a melancholy person. I'm, I'm not a sad person. I'm a, I'm a very upbeat, positive, energetic person, but I've been a leadership sad because I, I just feel that, that our country is living beneath its privileges. I just, I just think that we could do better. I think we could do better in the church. I think we could do better in government. I think we could do better in government. I, everywhere I look, it just kind of looks like we're a little bit in a leadership deficit. And so, I, you know, of course, I write all the time. And a, a few months ago, I felt very, very clearly led that, that I ought to write a book on, and I'm calling it High Road Leadership. And, and High Road Leadership with the subtitle, Bringing People Together in a World that Divides. And it just seems to me that it's a message that needs to be heard. And, and so we're, I'm writing it. In fact, I'll finish it at the, probably, probably in about two weeks. My goal is by the end of December to have it finished. And my, my goal is by April, May to have it out. Right? I, I, it needs to be out during the presidential election. It's just, just, we just got to put a little salt and light out there, folks. Got to, <laughs> got to get, in fact, we need a lot of salt and light out there. And, um, and so I'm writing the book, and I thought if it would be okay, I, I would teach a little bit, just a little bit from the book, and, and, and again, it, it won't come out for a few months, but, but, but you just grab hold of these couple thoughts that I'm going to give you, and, and then go see your friends and say, you know, I've been thinking about high road leadership. <laughs> and you just drop a couple thoughts I give you, and, and then in April, May, when the book comes out, you can just look at your friends and say, you know, I was with John, and gosh, <laughs> He took everything I taught him, <laughs> just stuck it in a book, and here he is. I, I, I gotta quit talking to him, just gotta, I gotta quit talking to him. But in the book, 
And we're going to put this on the screen because I want you to see this because I, I need to define what high road leadership is because I, I think we have a generation of young ones that are coming up that they probably haven't really seen what I would call high road leadership. I think they've seen low road leadership. I think they've seen my road leadership. I, I think there's a lot of roads they've seen, but they haven't seen the right one. And so what I'm going to, I, every chapter defines and gives a picture of what a leader is. And so I ask them to put it on the screen because I want you to see it. And, and, and I, you know, if you want to, you can take your camera and you take a picture of it. Um, in, in fact, let me just walk you through it. Are you ready? Are you ready? Because high road leaders, they do the following. They value all people. They acknowledge their humanness. They do right things for the right reasons. They give more than they take. They develop emotional competency. They place people above their own agenda. They embrace authenticity. They're accountable for their actions. They live by the bigger picture. They don't keep score and they desire the best for others. Would you like to have a leader that would do those 11 things in your life? That's high road leadership. Now, so let me just take a few minutes. I'm so glad you took the time for just worship and meditation and prayer, Chris. It was, it was so appropriate. I, I would be glad to cut anything I'm doing to have something like what you did for the people and I thought it was just beautiful. But let me just talk to you very quickly about three things, just three of them, three things that, that high road leaders do. And, and the first one I want to talk to you just briefly about is, is high road leaders value all people. And they value all people because God values all people. For God so loved the what? He loved the world. He, he loved the world. He, it didn't say for God so loved a certain group of people. It's not just, you know, for God so loved your friends, but he, he loved the world. And it's amazing when you look at the love of God, how, how encompassing is. You know, Paul, when he, when he was writing, Mary talked about the height of his love and the breadth of his love, the depth of his love, you know, the length of his love. And, and, he, and he just said, I just want you to comprehend the, the incredible love of God. And to be God-like and to be Jesus-like we just love people. We value people. Look, look at your neighbor and, and, and just tell, tell your neighbor, uh, uh, t just tell, tell your neighbor, I, I value you. Go ahead and tell them, I, I value you. You know, look at your neighbor and, and say, by the way, God values me too. <laughs> now, now, let me explain something. You were much more excited about the second one than the first one. <laughs> On the first one, you said, you know, God loves you. Yeah, you know, God, yeah, yeah. Oh, God that loves me. He's got that. <laughs> I want you to look at David and say, God loves people I don't know. Go ahead and tell them that. God, you know, God loves people I don't know. Yeah, because he does. And, 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 and look, at your, look at your neighbor and say, God loves people I don't like. <laughs> Be because he does. And that's the problem. That's the problem. The Apostle Paul said, I entered their world, their world, the world, people who don't know God, people who do not love God. He said, I entered their world to see things from their perspective. Why did he do that? So he could relate to them, so he could connect with them. And when I think of, of high road leadership, what I know beyond anything else is that it all begins with valuing people, and here's why. Only when we value people will we add value to people. If we don't value them, we won't be adding value to them. And, and so it's the heart, it, it, starts with, it starts with our heart. So high road, high road leaders, they, they, they just value people. I tell leaders all the time, when you stop loving your people, you need to stop leading your people. Because when you stop loving the people, then you'll start manipulating them for your own personal gain and for your own, your own self. So valuing people is a high road leader quality. The, the second one is that high, high road leaders, they acknowledge their humanness. They're, they're very in touch. They're very much in touch 
not only with the high side of life and, and the, their good days, and, you know, but they're very much in touch with the fact that, that they're one step from stupid and, 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 and very prone to be human. And, and this is a very important quality for a, for a person to be a high road leader. You know, I, I, I was shared today with the crowd, you know, there are days when I, I'm, I'm just like an eagle. I really am. You could just say, there's John Eagle. And I just soar. I just, you know what I mean? Dream big, think big, you know, live big. Yeah, I, I, there are times I'm, I'm like an, an eagle and, and I, I just, I kind of soar. But I want to tell you, I, I have some days, sadly, that I'm like a hippopotamus. <laughs> and I, I just wallow in the mud. How, how many of you have a little hippo in you? This is good. This is good. Because let me tell you, it's the, it's the hippo in me that allows me to begin to look at other people. And when they're not doing so well, and when they're quite human, and when they're in the mud, and they're kind of stuck in the ditch, there's something, there's something really beautiful about a leader who says, there I go also, except for the grace of God. There, there's something beautiful for us to remember not only what we've been saved from, but, but to remember our humanness and, and awareness because I, 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 when, I, when I sense of my humanness, it, it gives me compassion and it gives me a lot of, of care for people. It, it's, I, just think it's, I just think it's essential for leaders to, to always remember that, that we all have a bent towards sinning and we, we, we all came into this world born sinners and, and we, we all have times. How many of you have had a day in your life that you hope nobody really ever knows about? Huh? You understand? This is, this is part of the process. This is a part of the process. I, I was reading a cute article the other day who wrote to Dear Abby. So this is an old one is because, you know, Dear Abby's dearly gone. But she said to Dear Abby, she said, I'm 40 years old. I'd like to meet a man about the same age that has no bad habits. <laughs> Abby replied, so would I. <laughs> so would I. And, and I, I, just, I, I just love that because it's, it's, just, it's just exactly what I'm talking about. That, that, that if, if we just do better, we just do better as people, we do better as leaders, is if, 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 we, if we just remember our humanness, and part of that, I think, is the ability to, to not only enjoy success, but also to, to learn from failure. Because I've, dis, I, I, I've discovered that, that in our lives, honestly, I learn 10 to 1 more in my losses and my failures and my misses than I do in my success. So Bill Gates said, you know, success is a lousy teacher. It makes th people think they can't lose. And I think it's very deceiving. Chris, you did a fabulous job today. It, 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 today, he did, a, he did a new teaching that was just so great about the, the, the different levels of success and, and how it's delusional and, and, and how it, it, it just puts us in, in an unrealistic world and how do we have to be careful because success, the, if we succeed, it's almost always can lead to, to loss and failure. And, and, and we need to keep success and failure together. You need to keep them together. Don't separate. The world wants to separate. They want to say, succeed, don't fail. You know, they want to separate it. But can I tell you something? I've never had a day in my life where it was separated. I, I, I've never had like, well, this is my success day. Woo, yeah. No mess ups, no bad news, just success, success. And, and, and then I never had it. You know, well, this is my failure day. You know, this, oh my gosh. Shouldn't have gotten out of bed. The, you you got to keep them together. And the reason you need to keep success and failure together is they belong together because they serve each other. Success and failure, success brings the best out of failure and failure brings the best out of success. And if we keep them together, they really add value to each other. See, so when I'm succeeding and I'm on a roll, if I keep failure close to me and, and things are going good and everything I'm touching is going to go, if, if I keep my failure right beside my success, what that does to me is, is that in the midst of my success, it constantly teaches me humility. 
And humility is what we need to be teachable. And, and by the way, when I'm failing, I need to keep success right beside it because, you know, sometimes it's just not good and we're in the ditch and it doesn't seem like we're getting out very well. I need to keep success close to my failure because if I do, that success close to my failure teaches me resiliency. And, and, and both of them are needed. And, and both of them just really do really, really well, very, very well when, when, you, when you put them together. And, and high road leaders, they're, they're just they, they're in touch with their they're in touch with their humanity. They're, they're high road leaders, they just value people. But the one I just wanted to spend a little bit more time than the other two was this one. And, and, and it's so important that I, I hope I can teach this decent. I'm, again, I'm just writing the book, okay? So, and by the way, if you, if you got a good thought, I mean, while I'm teaching, you know, the, the book's not done. <laughs> you could be a co-author. You know, just... Give me your name and give me the quote. And if it's good, I'll put your name in there and give you the credit and put it in the book. And I'll give you no royalties. <laughs> but I'll sure give you credit. So I go back to my first church. You know, Margaret and I, I, I graduated from college the 1st of June. 14th of June, we got married. The 1st of July, we went to our first little church in southern Indiana. Little country church. Just, I mean, little, just little in a place called Hillham, 11, 11 houses, one country store, and one garage, and that, that was Hillham. And, and, and the old church building was over 100 years old, and roof sagged, walls bowed. I mean, the whole deal. And the first, by the way, the first Sunday, we, the, we had three people there, and, and two of them were Margaret and me. <laughs> and and, and I, I wanted somebody to come forward, so I made Margaret come forward. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it just, it was a, just, it, the poorest county in Indiana, just rural country folks. And, 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 and that's kind of where we got going. And I loved it. I, we had so much fun and, you know, the church couldn't pay me very much money, but Margaret, she was a teacher. So she taught kindergarten in the morning. She worked at a jewelry store in the afternoon. She cleaned, literally cleaned houses all the weekend because she said, I, I want you to work the church full time because they only gave me 80 bucks a week. And, and so I kind of worked it full time and loved it. And the church began to grow. And, and, and we literally, within, within about 18 months, we went from three people to 300 people. And it, it was just a, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I loved it. I loved every bit of it. And so, but, but there came a time, three years and three months after I was there that that I was ready to, to go to maybe a, a city and kind of expand myself. I, every time I've made a move, it's because I get claustrophobia. I, everything kind of gets closed in. I say, I gotta, I gotta move, I gotta stretch, I gotta, I, I, I gotta go a little bit further, higher. It's, but anyway, so I remember the Sunday I told the church that, that, that I resigned. And 90% and, and of the people in that church I had led to the Lord. I, they, I mean, I just did, yes, they, they were all basically Christians and, 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 and just, I had a wonderful time sharing my faith with them. And, and there was one of the fellows, his name was Arnold. And, um, and Arnold was the wealthiest person in the valley and, and he, was a, he, he had a, a, a lumber company. And uh, he, in that area, he was kind of pretty big and, and I developed relationships with him and led him to the Lord, led his family to the Lord, led his brother's family to the Lord, led his, uh, I, I probably had 25 to 30 people in that family to Christ. And so anyway, Arnold, we didn't have anything. Margaret and I had nothing. We, I mean, we just had nothing. And so he, 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 he would on Friday night, he would pick us up in his Lincoln Town car and he, he'd take us to Jasper, Indiana and, and he would buy us dinner every Friday night. And, and uh, you know, he'd say, oh, you know, John, you know, get you a steak and, uh, you know, baked potato. I mean, all the stuff. That I, and and I, Wednesday, uh, Friday night was our highlight. I mean, it was the only time we, we, we ever got to eat out. And so every Friday night, basically, unless, there, I mean, unless we were going, we, every Friday night we, we went out to eat. And so the day I resigned, I remember people came and it was pretty emotional. They were weeping and I was hugging on them and loving on them. And then Arnold came and he just collapsed in my arms. He just wept and I held him and told him how much I loved him. And then he said something to me. He said, John, how, how could you ever leave us after all I've done for you? 
And immediately I realized he kept score. He kept score. Now, I didn't know it, but I, I, I'll never forget how I felt. I, I wasn't upset with him. I wasn't, I just know how I felt. How could you leave us after all that I've done for you? Don't keep score. I, some of the most miserable people I know in life are people who are waiting for somebody to do something for them because they've already done something for them. And, and let me just tell you, there are several things that happen out of, out of a person when they keep score. And, and, and here's, what I, here's what I experienced personally. First of all, if you keep score, you put guilt on other people because you're ahead of them. You, you've already done more for them and, and it's, it's highly manipulative when, well, you know, after all I've done for you. And, 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 and by the way, if, if you keep score, I mean, the day that he told me that, I, I thought to myself, I could never catch up with him. I will always be indebted. I mean, he's already done so much more than, it, it was kind of like, He's, all, he's already way down there. And, and there's just a sense of, of guilt that's given in, in that situation. And, and I think it also encourages unhealthy comparisons. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm decently competitive. I'm not greatly competitive. I used to be much more competitive than I am now. But, but I got a lot of that knocked out of me because I, I think there's, in, in, in my journey, I needed to get a lot of that knocked out of me. I would say that. But there's a, there's a lot of, unhealthy comparisons when people keep score. And, and, and I find it, we kind of get into this game after a while of what I call compare and despair. And, and one more time, we're, we're trying to kind of measure up and, and, and we just don't always measure up. And, and I also felt, I always felt that it created a, a sense of unfairness. And, and what I mean by that is, um, I, I didn't know that we were keeping score. I didn't know that there was, I didn't know there was a game. I, I, I didn't know that he was counting every time he did something for me. And it's kind of like, that's another, not, I, I didn't know. I, I didn't know we were in the keeping score game. I, I didn't know there was a, I didn't know there was a game. I didn't know there was, I didn't know there was a score. I didn't know anything. And I could, I could remember how I just, I just, I just felt how unfair. And, and I felt also that it would, you know, it, I think it's a, I think it's an act of controlling people. It, it really is. I mean, it's almost like, you owe me. You owe me. And one of the things that happened to me in those next couple days is I sensed that it removed gratitude from my heart and my attitude began to go negative. And I hated that. I, I, I hated that. I, I felt gratitude reducing and, and bad attitude increasing. That's just not a good thing. It's just not a good thing in a person. And, 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 and I, I began, I began to, to see him differently. And I began to see, I began to see myself this I, I began to ask myself, well, am I a, a taker? And am I, am I a person that just, you know, that, that doesn't give as much as I, and, and it, just, it, just, it just took me and, and I just had to work through it for a period of time. But I made a decision that day. I mean, I was only 25. But I made a decision that I would um, never get in that position again. I made a decision that I wouldn't keep score. And I made a decision that I would always give more than I received in every relationship in my life. And that changed my life in an incredible way. It, it, it taught me to give. It taught me to, to give lovingly. It, 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 it taught me to, to give with no strings attached, to give unconditionally. And, and I, I, for years, I mean, I was a pastor, and you know, well, we'll take the pastor out to eat. I said, no, I'll, I'll, I'll take you out to eat. And, 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 and I, I, you know, I just, I just have got on the, the side of, of becoming a plus in people's lives and, and not a minus in people's lives. And I, I can promise you, that really has changed me. And today, 
I don't keep score with anybody, but I want to tell you something. There's nothing I love more than to share and to give and to lift. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's much more fulfilling to me to give than to receive. And, and, and when I think of Chris and our relationship and I think of coming here, you, you don't have any idea the joy that this gives me. The, the, the joy of, of me being able to, I, and I know I'm just a very little part, good Lord, it's just the old fat man that comes around once a year, you know, <laughs> then he goes home. You understand, and, 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 but you have, no, you have no idea what it means to me to be able to, uh, to share and love and give and be a part of your family and, and do, my, do a little bit, do, do a little bit, and to help Chris. I, I just want to, I just want to, Help lift him. I want to. I want to help you. I want to help the college. I. I just want to. I just want to gather. I've got friends. I'm bringing in and tell them to give money. I'm telling you, if you're my friend, you just don't really want to be my friend because I'm going to ask you to give money to the Highlands College. I just. I just am. I'm. 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 I'm I, in the name of Jesus, I'm coming after you. You understand? Yeah. And 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 and, and, and I just because I want. I want them to experience. But, but let me just say this. I've never known a happy person that kept score. I never have. I, I know people who are still waiting for that last person to return the favor. And I want to tell I had it when I was 51. I, I had a heart attack. And um, we, we, in fact, it was right about this time. Was, we, were, we were at our company's Christmas party and, and, and we were having such a wonderful time. And, we were, in fact, we were back then at Turner Field where the Atlanta Braves used to play and, and we had the whole thing rented out and the lights on the stadium and, and we were just to have, eat good eating, good food, playing games and, 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 and we were just, we were all dancing, having a great time and, and, and all of a sudden I realized I wasn't doing good and, and I thought, dear Lord, I mean, when you die, you don't want to die if you're a pastor dancing. <laughs> it's just not spiritual. You know what I'm saying? It, you go, you, know, you want to die. You, you know, how did he die? Well, he was on his knees in prayer, you know, but I wasn't, I wasn't praying. I was dancing, having a great time. And all of a sudden I, you know, you know, I'm laying down. And so anyway, I, I, I had a heart attack and, and because it was our Christmas party, my kids were all there and everybody was there. And, and, and so they, 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 you know, and, and for about three hours, they couldn't stop it. And it, it was, it was not a good situation. In fact, they called both of my children in to, to say goodbye to me. And, and, uh, and, and I, talk, I talked, uh, you know, you know you're in bad shape when, when you go, there's one doctor and three nurses, and two hours later, there are five doctors. And, and, and so I told them, I said, I'm a Christian. And I didn't have fear, just had a lot of pain. I mean, you know, and, and you know, so I was just asking for more drugs. Yeah. <laughs> just, I mean, it's terrible. He's dancing. He's having drugs. It's not a good night. You know, it's just, it's just not a good night. It's just, you know, that I just, not, I never hit the spiritual meter like I should. I, I just always seem to fall a little short, but, but I'll tell you what was incredible and beautiful is I, you know, I, is, is, and this is where I want to go. And then I, oh, oh, I'm done. You, you've been beautiful. It's, but this is where I want to go. As I sat there and I realized that, that this may be the end of my life, two things happened to me. I had incredible peace. That, uh, today, I, my faith is so strong because of that experience. I, I, I fear no death at all. I've already been close to it. I know what it's like to have the peace of God flood your life. I was, as, I was, as, I was so peaceful in my heart. Nothing, no, nothing anxious, but what's interesting is I began to do a little inventory and I asked myself, is there anybody I need to call to, to make something right or ask forgiveness or to apologize or kind of say, you know, I'm not doing well and remember when. And the greatest feeling I had that evening was the fact that um, I didn't have anybody to call. Now, I don't like telling that story often because it makes me look a lot better than I am. And, and I don't like stories to where it makes it look better than I am because remember, I have hippo in me. Don't ever, don't, listen, don't ever forget that. I have hippo in me. I, you know, I like to soar, but sometimes you just kind of want to wallow in the mud. 
But I can tell you, um, I just want to say that if you're keeping score and you're kind of holding grudges and you're kind of wondering why that other person hasn't responded back to you as much as you've responded to them, I, I just want you to know that it's not only the characteristic of a high road leader not to keep score, but it's, it's the characteristic of Jesus who loved us while we were yet sinners and who died for us. And I just want you to know that um, you can live a life of a high road leader and you can live a life of a person that is um, willing to turn the other cheek, walk the second mile, take off his coat. I've had some times in my life where I had some pretty decent losses, but none of those losses were worth me losing my integrity or worth me losing the joy of, of giving more than I received. And I would just want you to, during this holiday season, to enjoy the joy of, of traveling that high road. And if you have a, a situation where you're kind of emotionally in that you've been keeping score, I, I just want to free you up and just say, Jesus loves you unconditionally and you can love people unconditionally and, and just let God do a special work in your life. So let me just love on you and pray for you. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for what I've experienced again. Every time I come to this place, it's, it lifts me up. It, it brings joy to my life. It spiritually strengthens and nourishes me. And thank you for just how much these people love each other and love you. You're just, they're, they're just like a light on a shining hill. They're, their influence is just having such a positive effect on so many people around the world. And, and during this Christmas season, may you give them favor and bless them as they reach out and there'll be literally thousands of people saved because of the effort of this community. But I pray now for each one of us as individuals, help, help us to let go of the things that hold us prisoner. Help us, Lord, to understand that you can free us from all of that. And I just pray that your blessings would be upon every one of us. And may we not only just fall in love with you a little bit more during the Christmas season, but God, <laughs> may we just be a high road leader. And may we just do what Jesus does so we can be like Jesus. So may your favor and blessings rest upon the congregation. You have designed us and created us to reach our potential. And may during this season, we just climb a little higher, go a little bit more, take that, take that high road and just enjoy the presence of your love and the privilege and the favor of your blessings on us. So may the unconditional love of the Father and the beautiful sacrificial love of Jesus and the empowerment and equipping love of the Holy Spirit fill you now and forevermore. Amen. And remember, my name is John, and I'm your friend. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Come on, say thank you to John Maxwell, everybody. Our friend. All right, we've had a great night. I love you very, very much. Merry Christmas. See you Sunday. God bless you, everybody. Good night. <laughs>